Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different, each guest is unique, each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Wow, what a treat have I got for you today. I hope you are intrigued by the title of this episode, The Frequency of the Afterlife. Mysterious, alluring, exciting. Like a big colorful box with a beautiful sparkling golden bow on top under the Christmas tree, holding a very special gift for you, something you've always wanted yet you don't know exactly what it is. All you know is that you will love it, and so you can't wait to open it and look inside, and see all the secrets you've been craving to know about what really is on the other side. The title of this episode is a paraphrase of The Afterlife Frequency, an amazing book written by Mark Anthony J.D., who is a very special guest today on my show. But before I introduce Mark to you, I'd like to say a few words about his book. The various promotions of the afterlife frequency point out that this book reads like a juicy novel. Oh, one might say, that's just a marketing gimmick. Well, not so. Truth be told that when I started reading this book, I could not put it down, which doesn't happen very often. It is a superbly crafted, captivating, and very easy to read the story interweaving the factual and informative narrative unfolding the key topic with a novel-style recounting of Mark's real-life experiences and conversations with people. It does read like a juicy novel. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce my special guest, Mark Anthony J.D. Mark Anthony J.D., psychic explorer, also known as the psychic lawyer, is a fourth-generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He is an Oxford-educated attorney, licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, D.C., and before the United States Supreme Court. This psychic explorer travels to mystical locations in remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. Mark appears in the U.S. nationwide on TV and radio including CBS TV's The Doctors and Gaia TV Beyond Belief. He co-hosts the live stream show The Psychic and the Doc on Transformation Network and is a featured speaker at conferences, expos and universities, which include Brown, Columbia, Harvard and Yale. Mark Anthony is the author of three best-selling books. His latest, The Afterlife Frequency, is the gold winner of the Cover Visionary Awards, was considered for a Pulitzer Prize, and ranked as one of the top books about faith in God. His other best-selling books are Never Letting Go and Evidence of Eternity. He is also a columnist for Best Holistic Life magazine. And now, Mark joins me from an undisclosed location. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's an honor and pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. It's really great to be here. And to all my friends down under, hello. And you know, uh, Anna, 
my my live stream show, The Psychic and the Doc, is on 48 terrestrial stations in Australia alone. Really? <laughs> so it is, yes. Yeah, so it is so great to be here on your podcast. I can't thank you enough for having me. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. And we've got so much to talk about and I have so many questions. So let's see how much we can get through and cover. And I'm so thrilled that we have connected and can create this show together. By the way, you have a lovely energy, I have to say. Very centered, calming and relaxed. Very pleasant energy. Thank you. And your work is truly at the intersection of science and spirituality, which is the undercurrent of this podcast yes. and the focus of my work as well. I was certainly guided to invite you out of the many great mediums and psychics out there and the moment I read more about your work and your teachings, I knew, yep, we are on the same page here. I do appreciate, Mark, that you have done countless interviews and presentations, repeating your story many times. So rather than asking you the same questions, I'd like to do something a little bit different to set the scene for this conversation. Sounds so great. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I appreciate that. So, bit of a change. Go for it. Yeah, change. It, it's it, it's always good, and you know that kind of reminds me of like being in court because you may have a set format of what you think your trial is going to be, <laughs> and it never goes that way. So this is good. This is good. <laughs> Keeps you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. <laughs> so I will simply ask. What would you like to share about yourself, your work and your life with people who may not know you to give them a sense of who you are and where you are coming from as a backdrop to this conversation? What is important for them to know and understand about you and what you do to follow us for the next oh, 90 minutes or so into the rabbit holes and out on the limb? A lot of times when people hear um, my label, Psychic Explorer and Psychic Lawyer, they have to realize that the media has labeled me these things. And the Psychic Lawyer came from, I was in New York City at this conference in my capacity as a psychic medium, and a number of reporters found out that I was a lawyer. And they go, that guy's a lawyer and a psychic? And they started calling me the Psychic Lawyer in all these interviews, and it stuck. And, and my, uh, my publicist and my <laughs> agent were like, man, this is really good. And then when I started doing lectures and interviews about supernatural, paranormal phenomenon, uh, mystical sites around the world, another media outlet labeled me the psychic explorer. Um, and, and so what we did, by we, I mean my, my agent, my publicist, we sat down and had a discussion because we needed to combine everything in one. So I became known as Mark Anthony, JD, which is Juris Doctor. That's my law degree, Psychic Explorer. And that put it all together instead of saying, Mark Anthony, the Psychic Lawyer, also known as the, you know. And, and so because what I have done as an attorney is, did you ever see, Anna, did you ever see the movie with Al Pacino and Canal Reeves uh, called The Devil's Advocate? Did you ever see that movie? Yeah. All right. So and, and spoiler alert, and it's an older movie. So Al Pacino <laughs> is is the head of this law firm and they hire this young associate, Canal Reeves. And it turns out that Al Pacino's the devil. And and uh, and I remember there's this one scene where Canal Reeves goes, why? Why the law? And Al Pacino goes, because it puts us in everything. And <laughs> now uh, extrapolating that into into non-Hollywood terms, and this applies in Australia, Europe, pretty much everywhere in the world, can you think of any facet of our life that doesn't have some legal regulation? And sometimes that's positive, sometimes not so much, but if you're drinking water, which is safe to drink, that's because there's legal regulations. And what I always enjoyed, Anna, about the practice of law is that throughout my career, I had to learn about so many different things. I was a prosecutor, so I used to work for the um, uh, for the government to bring forth evidence uh, against people charged with crimes. Then I was on the defense side when I went to private practice. Then I started working in civil litigation with this particular emphasis on head injury litigation and studying about the brain. 
and, and damage to the brain and how the brain functions. So throughout the course of my legal career, I had to deal with forensics, I had to deal with physics, I had to deal with chemistry, biochemistry, medicine, um, every uh, different aspect of science, because in the trial, I'd have to have that expert witness on the stand or have to cross-examine the opposition's expert. So it gave me this huge base of knowledge. And I've always been one of these people. I'm interested in, in pretty much everything uh, from, from a very young age. My dad said my favorite word was why. And my dad was an aerospace engineer. He'd been a U.S. Navy SEAL. And he said sometimes it was a pain, but he just used to love like three-year-old me would walk up and go, why is this? Why is that? And I wanted an answer. And dad would explain it to me in technical terms. So when I started working as a medium, I saw the connection between everything I had learned about physics, about biochemistry, and about the functions of the brain through neurobiology and how this works. So spirit communication and the different forms of spirit communication are not magic, hocus pocus or some demonic activity these are all real phenomena which are explainable through science and i love how you embrace quantum living because the science that explains it is quantum physics mm, lovely thank you for sharing and by the way i love your sense of humor <laughs> It is always indicative of, of the person's engagement with life, the way I see it. So, And I love to, to have a lot of humor and laughter on my podcast because, let's face it, even when discussing profound topics and deep topics, people still like lightness and a bit of light in the doom and gloom of their daily life. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, people need to remember, don't take life so seriously. You'll never get out of it alive. Yeah, yes. And, and and the thing is, when I say that, let me clarify. We have, as a good friend of mine, Rhonda Schwartz. She is a, a fellow medium, absolutely brilliant and very gifted artist. She said that we have just one life, but it's eternal. And so when I say that you'll um, don't take life so seriously, you'll never get out of it alive. What I mean is our physical life. Because mm -hmm. once our physical life, once our body, the vessel that our, what I call the electromagnetic soul, we can talk about that in a bit, is housed mm -hmm. in. Once, once, uh, once our hard drive crashes, our soul goes on because yeah. it's eternal energy. So, yeah, we have one life, yeah. but it's an eternal life. Yes. And I tend to say, uh, laugh at life, otherwise life will laugh at you. Very, well which is another well put i mean <laughs> a lot of people turn to humor as a way to deal with stress and you know growing up all right both my parents were psychic mediums dad was a navy seal mom was a commercial artist so it's not like they were running around wearing turbans and waving ouija boards to people we were for all intents and purposes the all-american family next door sort of <laughs> and when you and at three and a half i start seeing dead people which is not a, well it, it's 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 not unusual for a toddler to have invisible friends but when mommy and daddy can also see them and identify that what i'm interacting with are spirits uh their interaction mom was like oh he's got it and dad was like oh geez he's got it because my dad was concerned about how i i would be treated by people who would think and and have thought that i was really weird and and that type of thing. So when you are a kid who grows up with psychic parents, you go to Catholic school and you're in a neighborhood surrounded by people who don't even begin to understand. If I didn't have a, a sense of humor, I would never have made it out of adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and you know what? You cannot laugh and be depressed at the same time. It just doesn't 
work. So if you make an effort to laugh at something or watch a funny movie or or hear a joke, your depression and sadness disappears because these are two contradictory emotional states. So great. We are on the same page here. Okay. What is spirit communication? How and why does it work? And please feel free to use your metaphor about calling out Martha. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if you like. Oh my goodness. If you All like. right. Spirit communication. <laughs> Think of our world as AM radio and the other side, the afterlife, as FM radio. They are two energetic systems. And really to get to all that, let me back up a bit. In my book, The Afterlife Frequency, I introduced the term the electromagnetic soul. And it's really important for our discussion if we if we start there and, and then we'll get to Aunt Martha. Um, we sure. know from science, everything is made of molecules. Molecules in turn are comprised of atoms. Atoms are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And then thanks to the, the uh, 20th and 21st century quantum physics, we now know that electrons, protons, and neutrons are made of a smaller particle known as a quantum, which is pure electromagnetic energy. Now, for all the science people watching, an electron is technically a quantum because it, because it is one eighteen hundredth the size of a of a proton. So uh, an electron is simply a negatively charged quantum particle. So what that means, Anna, mm -hmm. is that everything in our universe, from the chairs we're sitting in to the microphones we're speaking in to the radio waves which are transmitting this show around the world to the surface of Mars, the rings of Saturn, and beyond, are all at the same subatomic level electromagnetic energy. And everything in the universe vibrates at a different frequency. So, you know, I may, uh, the chair I'm sitting in vibrates at a much lower frequency than, than you do because you're, the energy surging through your body makes you alive. And so, we know from the laws of thermodynamics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. We know from the field of neurobiology, the study of the human brain, that the brain has an electromagnetic field. The human body, the brain uses 20% of the electrical electromagnetic energy within our body although the brain only accounts for 2 to 3% of the body's total weight. And so every great spiritual teacher from ancient India through Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Jesus, Muhammad, Yogananda, Paramahansa, uh, the spirituality of the um, Native American people and the Pacific Island people, the African religions, all of them teach that the who and what we are in faith, we call it a spirit or a soul. In science, we call it consciousness. That entity pre-exists the body, comes into the body, is hosted by the brain. And when that brain, which is like a computer hard drive, crashes, the brain didn't create consciousness, just like your computer hard drive didn't create the operating system on it. When that hard drive crashes, our electromagnetic soul lives on. So I developed the term electromagnetic soul because that's what we really are, pure consciousness, a spirit, a soul that is eternal electromagnetic energy. And some people have been critical. They say, well, that sounds very technical. But my, my um, dear friend, Dr. Gary mm -hmm. Schwartz, who's the head of, of the consciousness studies and uh, psychology, surgery, engineering at the University of Arizona, said, well, let's look at it this way. Soul stands for source of universal love. So the electromagnetic source of universal love is what we really are, pure consciousness that is eternal electromagnetic energy. And so when we start to understand that, we realize that our world, I analogize it to AM radio. Why? Because the frequency is lower than FM radio. 
because AM radio stands for amplitude modulation, FM stands for frequency modulation. And what I always tell people to understand spirit communication, it's kind of like you're driving down the road and let's say you're listening to your favorite AM radio station and you drive by a radio station, which is along the highway and it's an FM station. All of a sudden your radio starts picking up some from, from the, the radio station that you're, you're driving by. Well, that's frequency overlap. So what happens in spirit communication is that uh, the electromagnetic souls that are spirits adjust their frequency lower and the medium or the recipient in our world adjusts his or her brainwave frequency higher and you get a frequency match. Now, I go into great detail about this in, in the afterlife frequency and I get into the different types of brainwave frequencies and how and, and where within those frequencies this happens. But, you know, you want to know about Aunt Martha. Okay, so people say, well, how can you talk to spirits? Well, how can you make a cell phone call? So let's say here I am in, in the United States, and I want to talk to my Aunt Martha who lives in Sydney, Australia. So my brain sends, um, and remember, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So my brain sends an electrical impulse to my mouth and my vocal cords and another one to my lungs. So that electrical energy turns into muscular energy, which forces air out of my lungs. And my vocal cords take that, um, that mechanical energy of air and turns it into vibrational energy. That vibrational energy then hits the microphone, which in, in my cell phone. So now the vibrational energy turns into electrical energy, which hits the antenna in my cell phone, which is then transformed into radio wave energy. The radio wave energy is then broadcast and it hits a tower, which takes the radio wave energy, converts it back into electrical energy, goes through miles of wires to an antenna, which takes then the electrical energy, converts it back into microwave energy, or excuse me, radio wave energy, which then beams it up to a network of satellites that takes the radio wave energy Energy turns it into microwave energy, then it goes through a system of satellites until it gets to the correct satellite, then taking the microwave energy, converting it back into a um, radio wave energy, which then beams it down to a collection point in Australia, taking that radio wave energy, turning it back into electrical energy, which goes through miles and miles and miles of wires until it hits an antenna, taking the electrical energy, converting it back into radio wave energy, which then hits your um, a tower which takes that um, electrical energy and uh, radio wave energy and then turns it into an impulse, an impulse energy, which hits the uh, speaker in your phone and the speaker in the phone vibrates, taking the radio wave energy, converting it into vibrational energy, which then hits your eardrums, taking the vibrational energy into mechanical energy, causing the ear, um, eardrum to vibrate, which then stimulates the eighth cranial nerve after the stapes bones in your inner ear, which are mechanical energy, hits the stapes um, the stapes then hit the eighth cranial nerve, which turns it into an electrical impulse, which then goes into your brain and is converted into a recognizable concept, which says, hello, Aunt Martha. And the thing is, all of that occurs at 186,282 miles per second, which is roughly 400,000 kilometers per second, because that's the speed of light. And all those energy transfers um, occur at the speed of light. And we don't think about this when we pick up a phone and make a telephone call. I mean, could you possibly have described that to somebody in the year 1895? They would look at you like you have three heads. And it gets even funnier when all of a sudden your call drops out and you're like, well, how did that happen? Well, guess what? Everything that I just explained, one or more of those things may have malfunctioned. So people accept that we can communicate with each other all over this planet through all types of energy transfer and a network of satellites. But then they say, you can't talk to spirits, which are using many of the same principles, except they're not dependent on human-made technology. <laughs> oh, I love this story. But let me ask you this question. 
what happens with that energy? Because we're talking about the same energy. When your aunt Martha hears, hello, Mount Arthur, where does this energy go from that point on? Well, it doesn't get destroyed. It gets uh, transferred. So Martha hears, hello, Aunt Martha. Then her brainwave generates a response. And everything I just said now happens again, but all the way back to us <laughs> at the speed of light. So the energy never, <laughs> never disappears. It only transfers. Now, yeah. with spirit communication, the electromagnetic soul, which a number of scientists uh, have now adopted, and they're calling the EMS. And I remember when Dr. Gary Schwartz uh, was reviewing my book and he called me up and he said, oh, my God, 20 years ago, I came up with the electrical dynamical interface between the mind body. So he goes, Mark, you summed it up in two words, electromagnetic soul. I love it. I'm using it. So EMS, electromagnetic soul, is being used by a number of, of scientists uh, in the afterlife and near-death experience realms around the world. So now we know that the brain, which is a beautiful, beautiful um, instrument, did not create consciousness. Because that's the big debate, is where did consciousness come from? And if you read a, a neuroscience book, and, and my dear friend, Evan Alexander, and I believe you've, you've inter interviewed Evan. Yeah, yeah, he was okay. my guest as well. Yeah, he said, get a, get a neuroscience book, and it's 900 pages, and there's maybe a paragraph on what consciousness is. He said, because neuroscientists simply can't explain how it happened. They just sort of, oh, 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 consciousness happens. Well, that's because the brain didn't create consciousness. It merely hosts it. And I believe I, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, think of your brain like a computer hard drive. You know, your your computer hard drive didn't create the Windows or whatever operating system you're using. It merely hosts it. So that when the brain dies, when the human body dies, the EMS, the electromagnetic soul, doesn't die with it. And the way I like to analogize it, think of your electromagnetic soul as a drop of water. And so when we die, that EMS, that drop of water, plunges into the eternal sea of souls that I refer to as the collective consciousness. You're still an individual, but now you're energetically linked to other spirits, linked to other spirits, linked to other spirits. And what's fascinating about this is that people that have profound spiritual experiences, whether through a vision um, what's known as a spiritually transformative experience, a near-death experience, um, certainly mediums, we all understand this. They all talk about how coming away from that experience, we know that everything is interconnected. And what we now know from quantum physics is that everything energetically is interconnected. Um, and when you Think of the teachings that say when Jesus said, you know, we're all brothers and sisters, we're all interconnected. Buddha said things very, very similar to that. So now we're beginning to enter an era where quantum physics is proving what people of faith have been telling us for thousands of years. Energetically, we're all interconnected. Mm, absolutely. Now, I would like at this point to take it to a different level, take it to a spiritual level. And I have a very particular question, which can open many doors for this conversation, and to which I need to give a bit of a preamble. So please bear with me, because it is actually important. And the question is about reincarnation. And by the way, I haven't heard you talk much about it in your various interviews and presentations that I have listened and watched. So my understanding of the soul journey is that the soul is a consciousness of a unique frequency in the quantum field, which manages its countless fragments, which some people give a number of 144,000, I don't know, like a mothership, if you like. 
or an oversoul, as those fragments incarnate time after time as individualized consciousnesses or beings in the lower dimension, such as the third, the fourth, and the fifth dimensions on many planets in many universes, in many forms, including planets themselves. And anecdotally, one of my clients during his soul journey under hypnosis recognized himself as a planet, which was quite, quite interesting. Now, those soul fragments have their own frequency, always linked to the frequency of their oversoul and carry the same soul archetype in their soul DNA, which can be recognized as, as a pattern in most of the soul fragments incarnations. For example, I know that my soul archetype is teacher healer, and I, I'm sure that many people can recognize their soul archetype. Now, when we die as a physical being, our consciousness containing our personality and all memories moves to the afterlife, where, put simply, it reviews this lifetime and plans the next. And when everything is set up and ready, it incarnates again into a physical being. Here comes the big question. When we contact someone in spirit, a personality who passed 200 years ago or 500 years ago, or an Egyptian pharaoh who passed 5,000 years ago, who are we communicating with? I understand that it is a fragment of our soul consciousness with the memories and personalities of that incarnation we know and call by their name, which is left behind in the afterlife by that main soul fragment, which has by now reincarnated many times over across the creation. And it's not like St. Peter will pop into your reading saying, hey, Mark, sorry, but Jenny's great, great, great grandma is no longer in the afterlife. She's been happily cruising in other incarnations. <laughs> so what is your take on this? Because this, this issue keeps coming up even in my work with people. So if we keep reincarnating and we're contacting someone in, who's in spirit who passed many years ago, how do you reconcile those two aspects of our soul journey? First off, um, I have lectured extensively about reincarnation. I also was one of the um, headliners at the Edgar Casey Reincarnation Summit a few years ago, and I've also presented reincarnation as one of my lectures at the International Association for Near Death Studies, the Afterlife Research Education Institute, and I wrote about it extensively in my prior book, um, Evidence of Eternity. And my um, culpa, I've missed it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So, so I've I've spoken about this many times, and you know these people that get into one hundred forty four thousand and all that. It's like, well, that's their opinion because I've yet to see any empirical evidence of it. And in and I've conducted over fifteen thousand readings, plus having had a near death experience and working with many other near death experiencers, and. Spirits and all the NDEers, people who've had a near-death experience, all indicate reincarnation is real, which makes sense. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. How I explained um, what you talked about with the soul fragments, I don't, I, I think that that's one way of explaining it, but I have a much clearer way of explaining it, which I put forth in Evidence of Eternity. Um our soul, our electromagnetic soul, is a multidimensional being. We tend to think of it as sort of like, you know, our head is an Easter egg and uh, our EMS is the yolk that's in it. But because it is an electrical field, the EMS is emitting waves, which once again, through quantum entanglement, are connected to other electromagnetic souls. And so think of it this way. Our soul is a multidimensional being, and we have what you can, what many people have called a higher self, and that may be what what the the soul fragment people are talking about. Look at it this way: your higher self is a librarian, and the librarian, okay, 
your various incarnations while you're here on, on the earth dimension, maybe you are Anne of Green Gables in one life, Michael Corleone in The Godfather in another life. Um, you were a character in War and Peace. You were Anne Frank in uh, The Diary of Anne Frank. So there's all these different characters that you've played in different books, which we can call your different lifetimes. Now, these characters don't necessarily recognize or remember each other, but the librarian does. So let's say that you want to get hold of Anne of Green Gables through spirit contact, because uh, your, your cousin Anne, who used to live at Green Gables, has passed, and but she's been reincarnated as Michael Corleone from The Godfather. Well, gosh, I won't be able to get hold of them, but you've got the higher self. And so the higher self retains the memories and the contacts with all these different incarnations so that even though you've reincarnated or Anne of Green Gables is now Michael Corleone, you can still communicate with the higher self aspects of the electromagnetic soul who will be able to give you the information relevant to Anne of Green Gables. Does that make sense? Mm, absolutely. So the librarian yes. knows who all the characters in the books are, even if they don't. And then it gets kind of dicey when all of a sudden there's people who start remembering uh, prior lives. And we can talk about that in a minute. Now, mm -hmm. think about the the religions that have been studying reincarnation for thousands of years, Hinduism and Buddhism. And a lot of quantum physicists find Hinduism fascinating and, and with an and I want to give complete and total respect to all of our Hindu colleagues. If you take away, let's let's call it the, the fanciful mythological constructs, like you have to in any religion to understand what it really means, Hinduism is so close to quantum physics about the unending cycle of life. And, and Hindus even believe that if you know humans are stupid enough to destroy this planet through nuclear war, don't worry, um, we'll all reform in another universe and, and start over again, which is both <laughs> comforting and terrifying at the same time. But, <laughs> but on the quantum level, earlier when I was talking about on the quantum level, and, and this is one of the things I discuss in my reincarnation lectures, from Einstein's theory of relativity through Stephen Hawking, through Max Tegmark, it is believed that on the quantum level, time as we know it does not exist, which is why spirits will oftentimes bring up things that haven't happened yet, um, why people who do psychic readings can oftentimes discern future events. Now, the Hindus, and this is really cool, they believe that your next life, your next incarnation could be in what we call the past. So think about that. You may die in 2025, and then when you come back, your consciousness, your electromagnetic soul, the year is 1634, which mm. once again is yeah. both comforting and terrifying. Um, but, but the thing <laughs> is, is this all gets to time is relative, as in theory of relativity. Then I want to um, address mm. another thing about reincarnation. I always get this question, well... There's always the the intellectual in the audience. There are more people alive on planet Earth now. There are over 8 billion people, and that's more people than have ever existed in history. So how do you account for reincarnation? And spirits that I've communicated with have told me that is assuming Earth is a closed system. And what they explain is that Earth is constantly receiving a wave of new electromagnetic souls from other dimensions and other planets. And that eventually when people say, oh, I've reincarnated and now I don't have to come back. Because I've asked, I've asked spirits. I said, well, what happens? You know, I was raised Catholic. So, you know, I, I you know, I when I was a kid, my, my thought of heaven was a Michelangelo painting, you know, where everyone's hanging out, drinking <laughs> wine, really good at, you know, Italian and French wines, and and you're hanging out with angels and Jesus pops by for lunch, and you know, it's just great, you know. And I said, Well, does that get to happen? And I got the distinct impression that they were laughing at me just like you're laughing right now. And they said, well, no, you leave this incarnation, you transfer to another dimension and begin a new cycle on another planet. And I'm like, 
what what i go that 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 sounds awful and and i also got the because spirits do have a sense of humor oh yeah and they said why do you worry of such things that is energy that is the eternal journey of the soul i said well do we ever get to be god uh, I would get to be with God. And they say, you always are. Yeah. And, and so that really rocked my Catholic world. And, and I, you know, even though I was raised Catholic, I've spent my life studying all the religions. Um, I've studied Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. I spent time in Hawaii working with uh, the, the, the Hawaiian priests of the ancient religion. I've been with shamans in the Andes and, and in the American uh, uh, native American spirituality and the more you study the different belief systems, once you take away the, the cultural um, imagery, they're all the same uh, to, to a large extent. And they all talk about uh, the soul and the eternal journey of the soul. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, and in fact, conceptually, we are on the same page. We're just using different language. Exactly. It, it, yeah, and that's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about with religion. And also mm. with religion and quantum physics, they're describing some of the same phenomenon just through different vernacular. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So this actually very nicely segues to my next question. Have you ever contacted spirits who have just departed from living on other planets in this or in other universes? And is the afterlife and the soul journey for every soul across the creation? Or is this like, excuse me, this is the afterlife for the earth souls, and this afterlife over there is for the souls from Alpha Centauri, etc. So <laughs> that is a very difficult question to answer. Um, and I'm not trying to be um, um, evasive because what do you, you have to realize uh, that's what I'm going to explain. Mm -hmm. You have to realize that even though our electromagnetic soul and its higher self aspects are eternal and patched into the collective consciousness, and they're able to access information that we can't even begin to comprehend we have a brain. So think of your body as like a, a bottle and the brain, which is a finite being, is the cork. And the cork makes us have a finite perception. And that's not a bad thing. That is what filters and determines what we do while we're in corporeal material world form. So it is very, very difficult for us to actually understand what it's like to be a spirit because they're pure energy, which moves at light speed. And in the time it took me to just say that last phrase, that means a spirit could have been back and forth to the moon about eight times. That's how fast they move. So how can you and I possibly relate to a spirit an infinite being trying to explain to us what it was like to be a gelatinous cube in the delta quadrant of our Milky Way galaxy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but a very handsome gelatinous cube. Um, mm. Now, that being said, in the course of my work, and I have interviewed a number of people who have claimed to be alien abductees. Mm -hmm. And two of them, uh, Calvin Parker and Nancy Tremaine, are considered two of the most credible and reliable um, alien abdu abductees on record. Calvin Parker was 19 years old. This happened back in the 70s. And he was from Patchagoula, Mississippi. And he's got a real Patchagoula, Mississippi accent. He goes, Mark, I'm a redneck. And me and my friend, we took the day off work and we was fishing. And so they're in this remote area of Patchagoula, Mississippi. And he said, this here thing came out of the sky, this big metallic thing. And we knew it was up to no good. And we tried to run. And he said, they hit him with this light and they couldn't move. 
And then he described how these two robotic entities emerged from it, seized him and his friend, took them on board this, this UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. What he described was horrific. Um, the probings, the medical experimentation. He said the alien, the one that dealt with him, there was the two robots. And then the female, he said it was a beautiful, beautiful female. Um, but he said she wasn't a female because in... Um, in one instance, something happened and he saw her have this like reptilian look. And and what it was, the the alien was projecting a form that would be appealing to him. Now, I realize how this must sound to you and to the audience. But after this event and he was released, um, he and his friend. Um, oh, and by the way, the. The police department, the sheriff's department in that part of Mississippi that day were flooded with reports of people seeing a flying saucer. OK, so mm -hmm. people all over the place. And it's easy to say, OK, these two rednecks were, were making all this up so they could get on television. Calvin was horrified, said to his friend, we can't talk about this. His friend um, was was like 40 and he went public with it. He was on the Johnny Carson show, did all this and everything. But Calvin said, Mark. This did not make us rich. He said it made our lives horrifying. Calvin has been subjected to hypnosis, to polygraph tests, to uh, sodium pentothal, um, which is a, a truth serum. He's been questioned by the FBI, by private psychologists through institutions for the past almost 50 years. And every single time it comes up, he is not lying. They haven't caught him in any lies. And he said that when he was in his 40s, they came back and got him one other time. And so I've I've done readings for people who have been abducted and their spirits come through and their spirits have talked about this. And, and Calvin and Nancy, Nancy Tremaine was a little girl who was abducted in front of her entire neighborhood. Um, a large metallic object came down, hit her with a light. She couldn't move, took her on board. And she actually has mm -hmm. the recordings from the police department, which are going, there's this thing here. I mean, so so these are very, very heavily documented. And the spirits that come through usually are spirits connected to, to the abductees, but they do talk about these extraterrestrial entities as being able to manipulate time. That's why a lot of times, or in a lot of incidents, people who've been abducted don't have a accurate recollection of what happened because it seems like time has been warped. So I'm bringing this up simply to bring it up that like, like many people, um, when it comes to this type of thing, I try to keep a very open mind. I used to be more skeptical about it than I have been, but these are not the only people that I've done readings for. Um, and if you, if you will, I, I've done um, several readings for abductees and in all of them. And I remember I did the reading for this one guy. He was like the perfect male specimen. He looked like, you know, he stepped out of that Top Gun movie and all this. And he said he can't take it anymore. And his grandfather came through and explained about when he was abducted and why they're doing it. And he said it's because of the way you metabolize protein. And in every single reading, it has come up with how you metabolize protein is somewhat different. So Calvin Parker said the same thing. Nancy Tremaine said the same thing that after, after the abduction, they couldn't get enough protein. So I was interviewing on my show, um, Chris DiPerno, who is the lead investigator for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. And he said, when I told him that, he goes, what did you say? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, the, the, the spirit said that the aliens are looking for people with a special um, anomaly in how they metabolize protein. He said, oh my God, Mark. He said, in every one of the abductees that we debriefed, they described this insane craving for protein after the event. And he said, one guy actually ripped open a package of hot dogs and ate them raw in front of us. Couldn't get enough protein. Interesting. So anyway, I'm just, yeah. So anyway, I know that this is kind of getting off, but it is a related field. 
because we are dealing with entities who come from from some other place. Now, how does this relate to spirit communication, you might be asking? Well, in my work, um, I've interviewed, have you interviewed Colonel Dr. John Alexander? No. He used to be the president of IANS. He's in his late 80s now, sharp as a tack. I, I would recommend interviewing him. And he used to be head of the U.S. military's UFO project. Because in the last couple of years, governments all over are saying, well, these things are real. But as usual, the government's, you know, keeping things from us. And in my discussions with uh, Colonel Dr. John Alexander, brilliant man, he said that from what we can tell, it's not a tin can flying through space for thousands of years. Because the closest star to Earth is Alpha Centauri. And that's four light years away. And a light year is something like five trillion miles. So we are we are so far. And Einstein's theory of relativity indicates that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So how could something four light years or a thousand light years get here? What Dr. Alexander said, it appears that they're able to warp space time. And I know that sounds Star Trekian. But that's where Trek got it. Um, that's okay. I'm a big fan. Oh, okay, good, <laughs> <Star> good. <Trek. laughs> in, in fact, a few years ago, a Mexican physicist, uh, Al Kubera, and they call this the Al Kubera effect, explained that if we can generate an energy field of sufficient power around a particular object, the spaceship, you will actually cause a fold in space time. So think of you're holding a piece of paper and one corner is is earth and on the far diagonal corner is is alpha centauri all right so to go at the speed of light it would take four years one way we can't even come close to going to the speed of light but by generating this warp field you actually form a curvature in space time so you jump dimensions from one location to the next in seconds And so you're not violating Mm -hmm. Einstein's theory of relativity. You're actually working with it. And he said, this is possible. We just haven't developed the technology to generate that amount Mm -hmm. of energy yet. Now, when a spirit communicates with us and you indicated or you asked me before, well, what is spirit communication? They're jumping dimensions. And so... What we're dealing with here, whether it's aliens, whether it's what, you know, call shadow people, uh, what, you know, which are spiritual entities, uh, which are um, also electromagnetic souls, we're dealing with different entities using a similar energetic modality to jump from one dimension to the next, which is why spirits can communicate with us and come to us almost instantaneously. So that's why I'm going through that whole UFO explanation. Mm -hmm. And I know, believe me, I know how how crazy all this sounds. But once again, think of my Aunt Martha, cell phone over satellites, or look at it like this. Try to explain a microwave oven to somebody in the year 1900. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take this piece of chicken, I'll put it in the microwave, press a button, and two minutes later, it's done. Right. And... Nothing around it's hot, just the chicken. (laughs) Yes, yes, absolutely. Do you receive spirit contact spontaneously? For example, you are in the shops and Uncle Harry of the lady at the checkout wants to pass on his message to her. How do you control the spirit? Or do you? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, I tell them I'm doing this or I'm not doing this because it's important for a medium to define the parameters of the contact. You don't leave the doors and windows of your house open 24 7 so why should you do that to yourself mentally that being said spirits can be very persistent when they want to get a message through and a lot of young and inexperienced mediums come up to me in a lot of these tv shows which look i've been on tv a lot 
And so when I see these shows where a medium walks into um, a pizza parlor and goes up to somebody and says, oh, my God, I'm a medium and blah, 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 blah. Okay, first off, to get the five different angles, the close ups, <laughs> perfect makeup, perfect lighting, perfect sound, you need at least a three camera <laughs> shoot. So that means you're going to have at least half a dozen people in the crew. Then everybody in the background has to sign a release so that their face can be used in it. And it's going to take about four to five hours to film that 30 second blah, blah, blah. So you have to be very, very cautious. When I'm on TV, it's in front of a live audience and I'm doing it. Okay. And there, therein lies the difference. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so when I have, when I see TV shows like that, it's just like, oh Lord, you know, it's scripted. It's reality television is, you know, generally not real. Um, it, it depends on the particular production, but it is unethical to run up to somebody in a pizza parlor and fling a message at them from Aunt Uncle Harry, because those people are there eating pizza. They're not there to deal with their grief issues, uh, spirit communication. They may not be receptive to it. However, situations like this do happen, and sometimes I have, have broken that protocol, and it usually, in fact, always has been received very well, but uh, I still think that it is important to respect somebody's privacy and not just go up and fling a reading at them. It's like going up to somebody and saying, hey, you need a root canal and you grab a pair of pliers and start yanking one of their teeth out. All right, you're not going to do that. So why should you make somebody deal with, with yeah. their grief issues? Now, yeah. if they come to me for a reading, that's different. Yeah, yeah. So what do you say to the spirit? I mean, does the spirit understand or can they understand that oh, you can't just come up to someone and, you know, unless the message is really important, like they, are, they need to warn the person about some danger or something like that. But otherwise, they, they do understand. They still have an understanding of this reality and how we operate in the society. So they won't be offended if i can use this word <laughs> uh, i've got a great example of that i was flying <laughs> uh to newark new jersey because i was on a speaking tour of new york city and newark mm. airport is is right near the city and i was sitting next to this guy and he looked like he was in his middle 50s and you know we were talking just a little bit and i go oh, what do you do he goes uh i'm in entertainment and said it like that and all of a sudden, I feel this female energy around him, and it was his mother. And she goes, my son's a wise guy, meaning he was in the mob. And she goes, I really need to, to let him know that I'm okay. And I'm sitting there, and <laughs> so mentally, I said, ma'am, I appreciate this, but I'm not telling your son, the mob hitman, that his mother in spirit is trying to get hold of me. She goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you didn't say anything? No, no. And and I also <laughs> wonder sometimes if that maybe was um, the afterlife frequency giving me a lesson too. You know, like here, Mark, we're giving you a situation um, where you you should not necessarily um, do this. But uh, recently, I was um, I was the headline speaker at the International Association for Near Death Studies, and the annual convention was in Salt Lake City, Utah. And on my day off um, after the conference ended, I went to um, you know the Mormon where the Mormon Tabernacle Choir performance because you know I wanted to see it. And yeah, you know, I walked around, looked at it. It was interesting. So I was outside and I was sitting in their garden, which was absolutely beautiful, with my manager Rocky. And these two women and uh, gentlemen uh, were walking by and and they sparked up a conversation and uh, they said, well, what brings you here? And I told them, I said, well, I was with the International Association of Near Death Studies and and um, one of them said, you're Mark Anthony, the medium, aren't you? And I said, well, yes. And I said, you know, there's a female energy around you and I'm sorry, but she's really coming through. She goes, please tell me it was her sister who had recently died and this woman needed the connection. And she burst into tears mm. and she hugged me and said, thank you so very much. But in that particular situation, I felt that we were guided to be there. And these people who were not affiliated with the conference at all 
They just happened to be walking by and said they felt they needed to be in the garden. And so this is what I call spiritual synchronicity. This is one of the concepts that I, I um, describe in the afterlife frequency. Mm-hmm. Her sister spirit maneuvered all of us to be there so that she could give a message to her sister who was grieving um, so so profoundly in this world. So just because you can pick up on a message, don't fling it at somebody. You have to be very discerning in that particular circumstance. And I asked, I said, look, I don't mean to offend or anything like that, but I feel, I said, there's a female presence and I described it and she let up, she goes, my God, that's my sister. Yes, yes, I, I, I would like the message. Because if somebody said no, I said, that's fine. Because some people feel that this is negative or evil, and they start flinging verses out of the Bible. And the problem is, you can't be a salad bar Christian. And by that, I mean a salad bar, you go up and you pick and choose what you want. Um, You have to take the entire document, because the entire document is filled with with accounts of, of people who have psychic and mediumistic abilities. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm going to go to um, Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 11 goes through, you know, uh, stay away from mediums, witches, people cast spells. So people say mediums are not of God. It says so in the book of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, and and to which I always reply, yes, but please go to uh, the same chapter 18, verses 21 through 22, which says when a prophet and that's the code word for a medium or a psychic in the Bible. As prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. In other words, if what the prophet says isn't true, it isn't of God. If it is true, then it is. Then we fast forward to the first book of Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 4 through 12. Beautiful passage, one of my favorites. It gives a list of the gifts God bestows upon all of us. And two of the gifts are prophecy. The other is discernment of spirits. Yet all these gifts are from one in the same spirit, which is God. So it simply depends where in the Bible you look because sometimes we're good guys, other times we're bad guys. Um, One of my favorite stories is Saul and the Witch of Endor. So King Saul, he's fighting the Philistines. Um, David is a real nuisance to him. His popularity is on the rise. And Saul's favorite and most trusted advisor, Samuel, has died. So Saul goes to the witch of Endor, who is a medium, and she brings forth the spirit of the prophet Samuel, who basically says, Saul, your time is up. Um, You know, uh, you're you're at an end. And right after that, Saul is defeated in battle. His sons are killed. And then he dies by, by suicide. And then David emerges as the king of Judea, the king of the Jews. So, in ancient Judea, ancient Israel, the, the rabbinical community. See what happens when you talk to those people? And this is where we really get a bad rap. Okay, this is... Now, there's another way of looking at this. David emerged as the king of the Jews. And in the book of Matthew, it indicates that Jesus was a descendant of David. So was it not then the will of God that Saul played his part And when his time was up, it was to yield to David, because David is one of the superstars of the Old Testament, which is then a connection to Jesus. So you've got to be very careful jumping to conclusions and assumptions when it comes to spiritual messages. Did the spirit of the prophet Samuel make this happen to Saul, or did he merely reveal to him using quantum electromagnetic energy, future events that, Saul, I'm sorry, but your time is up. So that's that's another way of looking at this. Okay, we all need a break, so we leave part one of my riveting conversation with Mark for now. Grab yourself another cup of tea 
and go to part 2, released as episode 24, which has even more great messages, curious stories, and more fun. And things are getting curiouser and curiouser, as my good friend Alice would say. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.